On today's show, it is part two with Ricky O'Donnell of SB Nation talking all things draft, and it's coming up right now. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1743 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Wednesday. And this is part two of two with myself and Ricky O'Donnell of SB Nation. So if you missed part one, it should be available in this same podcast feed. I definitely recommend beginning with part one. There is some solo stuff there on, in terms of intel on the NBA draft, as well as the start of the competition that I had with Ricky. So go ahead and find that in your same podcast feed right now. Also, today's podcast is brought to you by the folks at the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. I also want to encourage you at the top of the podcast to make us your first listen each and every day. Please subscribe to this podcast, Apple, Spotify, Overcast, as well as on YouTube, where every show you can certainly like the podcast and subscribe and tell your friends about the show. No more long intros on this one. Again, we're diving right back in with Ricky O'Donnell on the NBA draft and a wide net, and we'll get into that right now. There are a few swing skills with Alex Sar, and we just talked about one of them being the jump shot, right? Um, I would also say, you know, there's some questions about the rebounding, for instance, which I'm not terrified of, but if he's a full-time center, I would start to be a little bit more worried about that, which I'm not sure about. Um, What do you make of, I mean, you, you used the word soft earlier, which I, I, I kind of agree he plays that way right now. That doesn't mean he's soft like mentally. I'm not, we're not at least I'm right. not saying that. Maybe you are. Uh, I'm, I'm not, not saying that. But he, not. He, he doesn't play through contact. He's not looking yeah. for contact. He's playing more perimeter based. Is that something you worry about being a problem for his career? Because I, I think, you know, one of the weapons he has is, is that body, right? You know, seven, four wingspan. He's got legitimate center length. And I'm not saying he has to be a bold, a bulldozer like Giannis, but like it's going to be limiting for him if he's not looking for contact, playing through contact, finishing through contact. Because that's one thing people, I think people that only see the highlights of Alex are, are thinking he's this like super like rim roller, lob threat. And that's not what he's been. Like he didn't really play that way at all in the NBL. And when he, around the rim, he's an okay finisher, but you don't want, he needs to, I mean, ideally he would not be an okay finisher. Like part of the appeal there to an athletic guy who's seven, who's seven one is that he's going to be a great finisher on the rim. And that hasn't really popped up yet that I've seen. Yeah. I mean, you know, here's the thing five years from now, six years from now, if I told you that Alex Sar is running over people, would you find it hard to believe? Because no. I personally wouldn't at all. No. Yeah. Um, I think he has, you know, you're drafting him for what he could be one day, not what he is today. That is and 100% I think right. that as of right now, he struggles to play through contact. I find this to be, not a terribly concerning flaw in him because he's so young and he's still just growing into his body and growing into his game. Um, But certainly you don't want to have a guy like that be contact averse. And I think right now he is a little bit contact averse. Um, Like he's not just going to like recklessly throw his body all over the place the way that Ron Holland would, but you know, the size difference between the two of them is just enormous. Uh, And I think Sar might be probably as athletic as Holland too. Like Sar is like a really good run and jump athlete. I think, I don't know what your evaluation of that is, but uh, so, yeah, I mean, I do think that's a swing skill for him. Absolutely. Being able to play through contact, add weight, but I think, you know, it's a process and I like the idea that he doesn't have to like, be a big time screener and like short roll guy in the early part of his career or a handoff guy. Cause I think a Kongu could do a lot of that stuff. Uh, And then Sar can kind of just sort of make those like opportunistic style plays early in his career. Yeah. I I think what you said there, I don't want to emphasize it because I a hundred percent agree. And there's always this conversation about, what are they now? What are they going to be as rookies? It kind of goes back to that Sar and Klingon thing because Klingon is just more NBA ready. It's more like projectable. Like I, I have a pretty decent feeling that Klingon's going to be better this season. That's not what I would draft for personally. Um, but you know, the Hawks are more of a win now team than some. Uh, it doesn't mean you change your evaluation, but it's just worth keeping that in mind. The Hawks are not a team that is like the Wizards, I keep using the Wizards as my example because they're the number two pick, but the Wizards are like this blank slate, who cares next year kind of team. Yeah. 
the Hawks are not. They're they're trying to win now. So it's this weird. And I'm going to say this until they draft him for the most part. But like I I'll be fascinated if it happens if they take Alex Sark number one how they handle him as a rookie because he's probably not going to help them win and they want to win. So it's this really interesting like. But he's also the number one pick and you know this you follow this stuff. There's politics here. I mean, how often does the number one pick? much less not start games, but not play a lot of minutes. Like it just doesn't happen. Like guys, if they're healthy and the number one pick plays, it's just what it's going to happen. So uh, that's a different conversation, I guess, but I'm just, I'm fascinated by all of it. Just, and that goes back to what we we started with about this, the team projection, what you're valuing and what you're looking for is kind of ultimately more than a tiebreaker. It's like kind of what you're basing the pick on beyond just like, I have started one on my board, which they might, but even if they had more on the board, they might pass if the, if number if the number two guys close and tears and all that stuff. Yeah. So you're like saying, yeah, they're trying to win. Okay, they're trying to win. They won 36 games last year. And they got their well, ass kicked by the Bulls. No, I, I'm not, so, I yeah. And look, that's a very very, very it no, it's it's a very fair retort, and I, I'm not actually. It's actually I'm glad you said that as plainly because I don't. I probably didn't say that plainly enough. Uh, in fact, uh, Sam said that on the show. Sam was like. You know, they're not that good. I'm like, I know. I'm not saying they're great right now, but they do have more established players that they like. And yeah. they're out the picks that you mentioned. They're already out two picks in the future plus a swap. They're not rebuilding. Like you could argue whether they're whether they should rebuild or not, but they're not. Unless something changes that I'm unaware of in the next, as I check my uh seven days, they're not rebuilding right now. So it's just I guess like he's getting minutes. I don't know if he's going to start, but like what I would do is play a Kangu, Sar, Jalen, all the minutes in the front court. And if yeah, you want to put that. some DeAndre Hunter minutes in there, like who do they even have? Yeah, DeAndre. Hunter's the, Hunter's been starting at the three. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm just I, sort of I, assuming Capella's going to be gone. In this I, I tend to like your idea if they again if they draft Sar of just kind of like having this three headed front court mon- uh, monster. Of the of Jalen Sar and Akongwu, yeah, and obviously it's not going to be all forty eight of every game because injuries or whatever. But that, that that's a good, I think, especially early in his career, that makes a lot of sense to me. Because you're, I mean, yeah, I, I what I've been saying is if if they draft Sar or or Klingon, they are almost. I, I, I never want to use the word guarantee. I will fall out of my chair if they draft Sar or Klingon and then also keep both Capella and Akongwu on the team. I just don't see yeah. why you. I don't see why you would do that in general. It's just too many mouths to feed guys. Because Capella, for all his flaws, has to play. He's too good to not just not play. And Akongwu, they like still, and you know, all that stuff. So uh, anyway, that's Alex Sar is the guy you like the most. He's number one on my board too. I, I've strategically not said what I would do on the show. I'm trying to hold that off, but I, I have admitted that he's number one on my board. That doesn't mean that I would pick him necessarily, but it is. Uh, I think his his, his overall pack his overall package is really uh, is appealing. There's but but for me, okay. Actually, I'm, I'm going to ask you this: Is he in his own tier for you, or is it I, I, no. or is it close? Okay, he's not so even number one for me. I, I think I'm going to put Topic number one just because he's been my guy the whole time. Just so, just mean, to do it. Well. No, I no, I, I mean, get it. The thing is that it doesn't really matter if I'm wrong. So who cares? <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, I'm all about planting flags. Like I. Uh, it's not quite number one overall, but I, I've been waving the Ryan Dunn flag for as long as I can breathe, basically. And I know he okay. can't play offense. I get it. But uh, just I hope he gets somewhere where they can teach him how to do something on offense. Like, you know, the example that I would use is Andre Robertson was really useful for a while. Yeah, like, he, was really, good. he was actually quite good for a while. And that's that's what I think he could be when he would nothing. Anyway. Today's show is brought to you by the Game Time app. The Game Time is an all-press ticket marketplace at the NBA that makes getting tickets for basketball faster and easier for you. They have killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from receipts, and the lowest possible price guarantee. That makes Game Time a fantastic option. That makes things easy for you. I've been a regular user of Game Time for quite a while now. It's coming handy for me, especially with like Braves tickets and Falcons tickets, as well as other shows and concerts in the city of Atlanta. And you can save big when buying last-minute tickets for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and much more. They have flash deals. You can save big there as well. You can also save even more when you choose a section and let them choose the seats for you in that section. There's also a feature at game time when you toggle the, actually toggle to show the total up front. No surprise fees when you get the checkout screen. And also get a parent review of the seats in the app before you buy them so you know what to expect when you get there and you are getting the lowest possible price with the folks at game time. 
Take all the guesswork out of buying tickets with the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app right now, create an account, and use promo code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create that account and redeem that promo code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Let's save Klingon for a second. I'm going to ask you about Re- about Risa Shea. It's been a lot of Sar versus Klingon recently in the discussions. Um, do you like Risa Shea? Because I feel like there is a pretty big split. And you wouldn't know it looking at the internet sometimes. Like, I know ESPN's had Risa Shea number one for a long time, for example. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of people that I I trust that have him, like, not, like, way down the board, but, like, more of a, more like a mid-lottery guy. And that's a pretty big split, even in a class like this. So how do you think of, uh, of Risa Shea? I got him as a mid-lottery guy. But I feel less confident in my evaluation of him than I do any other player, really. And why is that? And, um, just because I didn't watch like a ton of them. Like I just probably watched him less than the college guys. And then like, you know, watching the G League Ignite sucks. But like I just oh. did it a lot. Yeah, it was it was painful so, actually. Yeah. No, I and honestly until the Hawks won the guy. lottery. Yeah. Until the Hawks won the lottery, I was with you. I, I had not watched Risha Shea enough. And then I kind of had to. So I just yeah. really started digging in because I had to. He was also still playing, which was helpful. And also, yeah. I think he had a couple good games when he was the only one totally. playing, which probably. The best games probably, were deep in the playoffs. That's a good sign. Yeah, that probably helped uh, everything across the board. But you mentioned earlier something that I was going to make sure to follow up on about Sar not being a shot creator, right? Neither is Risha Shea. I, I, I don't right. think. So. No. But is it uh, is that more of a problem when you're a six nine wing than it is when you are a seven one combo big, or are you okay with a six nine off ball? Pl- uh, look, I'm not saying he can't be an off ball player, but right now I th- I project him as an off ball player for the most part on offense, which is there's nothing wrong with that. But number one overall, it's it's a different calculus. Totally, yeah. I mean, where is his potential to develop on ball? That's why I don't feel very confident in my evaluation of him. Because, like, does he have maybe more upside in that area than I have seen in him or that I think he has? Like, maybe. Um, and Otherwise, it really comes down to how good of a shooter he's going to be and how yeah. much volume he's going to shoot on. Because if he's a really good shooter, then you're feeling like, all right, well, that's good. Like we'll, we'll take that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, Bogdanovich is a really good shooter, and he's a high volume shooter, and he's what six six, and Risha Shea is like six nine. Is Risha Shea six ten? Yeah, I think he's like six nine, but he's not a huge plus wingspan guy. So I think he plays. He, I think he plays a little bit smaller than, than the height. And to me, it seems like he seems more comfortable defending guards than like Jason bit. Tatum. Like, are you putting him on Jason Tatum? So if you're playing the Celtics, who's he guarding? In his peak version, <laughs> or even let's say in the yeah. in his second year, in his second year, who's he guarding on that team? Yeah, I mean, you would hope he's going to be able to guard wings because look, and yeah. I, I promise I'm not trying to pile on at all because I I do think he's a real prospect. But if if you don't think he's an on ball player and you're not sure he can defend the top level wings, what are we doing? What are we even doing here at number one overall? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and and you mentioned the shooting, I. It's not that I don't believe in the shooting, but I don't think that he is a lock to be a great shooter. No way. Based on based on what I've seen. So like, and for me, it's really hard to see him succeeding if he's not a plus shooter. I don't, I'm not saying he has bogey. to be bogey because bo- bogey is a phenomenal shooter, like top 10 yeah. in the world, I think, shooter. But like, he doesn't have to be that. But if he's not a 37, 38, 30% three-point shooter on real volume, like, I don't know how he's supposed to be I mean, he, he can still be a good NBA player, but like, I don't think he's going to be like this huge difference maker if he's not a plus shooter. That's me. Totally. That's also not a super duper high bar to clear. He was just playing in a good French league, playing huge minutes, a big role at what is he, 19? And yep. he just hit 39%, didn't he? So, like, yeah. Probably his shooting projection seems like it should be good. I, you know, I had watched I think it's him. In good. The FIBA. I had yeah. watched him in the FIBA stuff before this season and he couldn't shoot at all there and i'm right. like lower I'm that, that's the thing I, I i think it's good but also he was he's been very streaky and it's not a tiny tiny sample size but it's not huge either and i think he at one point this year in the middle of the year he had a month or maybe six weeks where it was like he was shooting in the 20s 
and then he got really hot again. And, it, and the full size sample matters more, of course. And you mentioned, I think it was like 39%. But I just, I don't mechanically any, I, I don't, I don't see like definitely a lead shooter with him. No. And I think he's got yeah. a high floor as a shooter, but the question is how high is his ceiling as a shooter? Yeah. Um, so like, you know, I asked the question about the Celtics, but let's say you're playing the Knicks. Like, is he guarding Brunson or is he guarding Ananobi or is he guarding Randall? Like to me, I think you might want to put him on Brunson and Maybe. that type of guy, if he could guard guards and smother them with length. Philosophically. Now that's pretty interesting. Well, um, yeah, especially, especially with the Hawks. I mean, and I, I've been operating under the, uh, not necessarily assumption, but the Hawks will probably, I still think, probably move one of their guards, and it's more likely to be DeJounte than Trey, I think. But they've always needed somebody that's a wing-sized guy who can defend guards because they don't want to put Trey on Jalen Brunson, for instance, in your Knicks example. Like, they don't – Trey's not going to ever be the guy they want to guard. If the other team's best player is a point guard, they're going to want someone on their wing line to guard that guy. It's not going to be Trey. So – Maybe that's one of the appeals is that the Hawks just believe that Richard Shea is going to be able to take away smaller guys on the perimeter um, in a way that DeJounte kind of failed at doing, honestly, in over two years. DeAndre Hunter used to be that guy for them that he had knee issues and kind of probably lost a half step, and now he kind of defends wings exclusively. He kind of went away from the guard thing. So that's more Hawksy than we have to be here. But um, it does matter. I mean, because if, if you're doing this, yeah. I, I do think that maybe one – argument you can make for Risa Shea is that you have Trey Young, so he doesn't necessarily have to be able to create as much offense as he would be able somewhere, somewhere else. That's a reasonable argument, I think. Yeah, and it's like, if you compare Risa Shea to Klingen, hypothetically, like, if they're both, like, the more NBA-ready guys, and you feel like you could plug them and play them, well, I mean, you did use what the sixth pick on Kangwu and he should probably play. Uh, <laughs> you would, you right? would think so. That's actually like a question he, I get a lot uh, from people. It's like, well, with, especially, especially around clean, but even around SAR sometimes it's like, well, the Hawks have a Kangwu. It's like, well, yes, they do. And you and I, I, I know you liked him as a prospect, still like him from the sounds of it. I like him as well. I always just remind people that the front office that drafted the Kangwu is not there anymore. This is a new regime, yeah. new new coach, new front office. And that, this, this, that doesn't mean that they don't like him, but it does mean that they're not tied to him. So, and it's just, he's just finished year four. Like, so where he was drafted does, I guess, matter pedigree wise, but like in the practical world, he's just a player on a contract now. Like where he was picked, I don't know if they're married to a Kongwu in the way that maybe they, you could argue should be, but I, I just, I don't know where they even are on him. I, I'm not saying they're going to give him away, but like, I don't, know if this regime thinks that he is definitely their center of the future based on just all, I mean, plus SAR and if they like, if they like playing this much as it's been reported, clean is their center of the future. You would, I mean, that's all the way you get to that. Uh, even just being a talking point is that you think that Klingon is like your guy at center for a long time. Totally. Yeah. And I would say the argument for Risha over Klingon is that you think, okay, we could find a big man easier than we can find a wing yep. and Snyder wants to shoot a lot of threes based off his history. And so Risha Shea could help us with Snyder's style of play. And I would say that, uh, you know, Risha Shea, perhaps more of a two-way player than Klingon, who I think his passing is good. And I think that like that can definitely be tapped into, but, you know, I don't feel great about Klingon scoring. Like, I don't think he's going to be a big time scorer. So, uh, you know, Risa Shea will probably score more than Klingon. He'll shoot more threes. And if he's a pretty good, uh, you know, defender of wings or four or wings or guards or whatever, then, you know, every team needs a guy like that. And yeah, like you mentioned the Trey thing, like he doesn't need to create offense because Trey can carry a, you know, the, an engine type of load and always has. And so, yeah, I would say that's the, that's the Risa Shea argument.
Today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks, and with Prize Picks, turns ten dollars into one thousand dollars in a single game. When watching your favorite sports this summer, you can make a lineup of Prize Picks in just as little as sixty seconds, which is huge. If you are so busy, like I happen to be this time of year in particular. All you have to do is pick two to six players, actually choose more or choose less on their projections, and you are locked in from there. PrizePix is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Get on the daily action with your friends and become part of the PrizePix community right now today. Basketball means more Price Picks, so do the star players. You can boost the payoffs and select basketball stars you can't, you can't find anywhere else. And even with the NBA season now over, the hoops action does not stop at all at Price Picks with WNBA stuff with stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. We're up to 100 times the cash watching them ball out. Price picks is the best way to get on the action in sports in more than 30 states across the country. That includes Georgia, California, and Texas. They also quick withdrawals. Download the Price Picks app today and use code Locked on NBA for first time deposit match up to $100. Again, download the app and use code Locked on NBA when you get there for first time deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Price Picks. I was going to actually ask you about the positional thing. You kind of brought it up. You know, there's that's one of the thoughts of having Reese Shea as high as some do, again higher higher than I think you and I do on our boards. Is that exactly what you said? Like it's kind of easier to find centers. It's easier to find bigs, but there are not a lot of six nine wings who can shoot and defend growing on trees. Every team wants that, and I get it. Like the archetype factor matters, and if I was drafting at four or five, I would probably like that a little bit more, but. What do you make of that? Like, how much do you? How much does that change your weighting? If you are, which, I mean, let's just use the Hawks as an example. Would you bump up a half a tier just for positional value? Like, how do you think about that? I wouldn't consider it because the Hawks aren't good enough to consider no. it. I mean, they won't, they were trying to win in the East and they won thirty six games. So it's all fair. I kind of think who cares? <laughs> okay, no, I, I, I had to ask the question. Um, we don't. I mean. <laughs> But, oh, just uh, like because you brought up the cling and scoring thing. I think that I probably just from listening to you and reading what you've written so far, I think I like his offensive game a little bit more than you do, but I don't think he's gonna be a primary scorer by any means. Like, I think he's gonna finish well. Like, his efficiency numbers were fantastic at UConn. There yeah. is an argument about like how much of that is him versus how much of that is like UConn playing the best offense, like as far as like schematically and. Yeah. All of that. They're, they were loaded, of course. But I do think that he he's he really showed to be a really good finisher, at least at UConn, and he, he is massive. I don't know how much of that is, like can be self-created, but, you know. In his, like, all-in-one numbers were amazing. He was basically the second-best player in college besides for Edie. Yep. And just, like, all the impact numbers and stuff. And, yeah, on a per-minute basis, he was just, like, super-duper impactful. And like you said, I don't know what his true shooting percentage was off the top of my head, but it was probably 70-something, I would guess. It was very high. I don't have it in front of me either. I'm looking it up now quickly. But, yeah, it was in the um, um, at least the high 60s, if not higher. Yeah, it was uh, 60, I think 65%, something like that. Okay. So was, and then, But, you know, I'm, I, you know, I think Gobert, and maybe this is, like, too lazy of a comparison, but, like, I'd say, like, Gobert is not a great scorer, and he's more athletic than Klingon. Um, yeah. I'm going real lazy on this. So Gobert's no. best scoring seasons were like 15 points a game. So like I don't I view Klingon scoring less than 15 points a game. That that's um, not unreasonable. Obviously, you, you just use the word lazy. It's, it's fun, it's very broad, but you're that's not wrong. I do think that Rudy Rudy's, of course, the comparison it makes pro or con. Yeah. Uh I personally value Rudy a lot. I think he's really good. He's um, amazing. There's a Hall of Famer. What I would say is Reed doesn't really have, I mean, I guess you see it sometimes in international play where like they actually post him up and let him do stuff. But I think Klingon's got more like post up juice than Reed, than Reed does. Yeah. And he's certainly no. a better playmaker. I mean, it's not even Definitely. close. The, the passing, passing, yeah. He's got better That's, hands. Right. And, he, and he's, equally, he's equally he's, huge. But I don't think he gets off the ground as quick. I, I would agree with that for sure. Rudy's a better athlete. I mean, Rudy's a, that's something Rudy, this is a sidebar. He's like, underrated at how much of a freak he is. He can run forever. Oh. Crazy athlete. Well, and I remember when Snyder was coaching the Jazz, he would say that Gobert's his best perimeter defender. Now, maybe that was because he had Tommy yeah, Mitchell. He had no perimeter Tommy. defenders. <laughs> yeah, he, he had a lot of bad perimeter defenders in front of him. But, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, if you could tell me Klingon would have uh, Gobert's career, I would take him number one, no doubt, to me. Oh, and I know not, that, like, not even – by the way, no, not even – I'm with you, not even – close if you knew he would be rudy this is not even a discussion in this class in some classes you might you might debate it 
But you mentioned earlier, Rudy's a Hall of Famer. And I think people people like to crap on Rudy, and I get that. And there's, uh, I'm sure you've seen this, there's a lot of talk about, like, if you look at Boston's five-out system, why wouldn't you want to match that? And, like, why would you draft a center who isn't a five-out player? I get that, but Boston was pretty uniquely loaded in a way that you can't really <laughs> replicate. Yeah. Uh, and also, on defense, Porzingis is not, like, flying around. Like, he's playing a lot of drop. Like, they, they do play a lot of drop defense in Boston with Porzingis on the court. It's just that they have the best guard tandem in the in the league and a really good wing tandem to go along with it. Like, that's not really replicable. All due respect. <laughs> anyway, that's just me. Yeah, um, totally. Build, Bo- build Boston is not a uh, something that's just, like, easily done, I would say. No. And even with Trey, like, all their guys are way bigger than Trey. So you can't replicate yeah. Boston with Trey on the team. Well, and also part of Boston is like they don't have a weak link on defense. And I'm glad you brought up Trey because there's this there's this thought process that I see sometimes about like especially with Sar versus Klingon, right? Where Sar is the multifaceted defender. And I get that. There's a lot of ways you can play him defensively, and that's really appealing. But you still have Trey. And Trey isn't going to be someone you're switching one through five with ever or at least most of the time he's not going to do that like there's the argument of i thought for a long time of my uh, my friend andrew kelly thought this talked about it like if you were to pick a guy in the league maybe you could say two years ago maybe even still now to like pair with trey on defense it would have been rudy because like you, you're playing drop but you're playing drop yeah. anyway i was you, gonna you say the opposite Way. Well, yeah, that works too. And I, I almost said, you know, there's AD, there's, you know, prime AD when AD yeah. is like in fully engaged, but like all those, I mean, yeah, Giannis is a freak, but, um, and maybe that's the SAR argument in a nutshell, yeah. but you do need, I, I think it's okay to have to quote unquote, have to play drop or not be able to switch. Because like, like you're, if you're, if you're already tethered to Trey and I know some, there's, a, there's a, I would say a growing Hawks contingent that's not really tied to Trey anymore, but at least from what I understand, the Hawks still want to keep Trey and build with Trey. And if that's their plan. If that's their plan, you can't build a switch everything Houston Rocket style system. You got to have somebody that, that can play pick and roll conventionally with it. Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, fascinating pick for the Hawks, man. It is. But do you want to trade fair. number one for Kobe White and Alex Caruso after uh, Kobe? Bo- Wait, both of them? That would be interesting, yeah. actually. Uh, cool. I, I'm sure. I'm sure you saw. Um, maybe you didn't see. Um, Matt Moore reported that the Bulls checked in on Click Capella. Yeah. And uh, I was going to bring that up to you on the podcast at some point. So we're going to do it now. And uh, I, be, I, I tweeted about that, and someone immediately said, "Can can we get Caruso?" And I was like, "Not for Click Capella, I don't think." <laughs> but it's the Bulls, so who knows what they're going to do? Uh, sorry, sorry, Rick. I didn't mean it to seems do. like they want to use Caruso to trade up. The Bulls want to trade up because they want Matas. That's their guy. Do you like Matas while we're here? Um, I do like him. Yeah, I'll probably have him five or six. I think he's got a decently high bust rate because if he doesn't shoot, I'm like, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I mean, and he didn't shoot well this year at all. Yeah, yeah, he shot horribly, and he has way more variance in his shooting floor than someone like Risha Shea. Like Risha Shea is a way safer bet to shoot than Matas. I agree. So. Um, I do like Bazellus, though. His defense was much better than I anticipated it would be. And I think that, you know, he just has some, like, creativity off the bounce that you don't see in guys who are 6'10 and can potentially play power forward. So He's, athletic. He's super athletic, too. Like, really athletic. Like, very yeah. Athletic. Uh, when I watch him, sometimes I just wonder, like, he just sort of seems like uh, maybe he doesn't have the greatest feel for the game is the way I would put it. Like he, he doesn't always strike me as having a serious approach. Um, Which is, I wonder, I wonder how much of that is like G league weirdness. Totally. That, that was a bad, that was a bad team to play on. And you know, I, I know you watched, obviously you watched a lot of Holland. Uh, Holland of course has the renowned motor, but also had moments where I was like, what are you doing? But it's also a, the no spacing ever around those guys. It was just, the whole thing was a disaster. Um, so I guess Ron Holland's, high on your board we talked about him is there anybody that you love in this class does that have to be a hawks thing but obviously we could do a whole we won't just for time purposes talk about like trade down options because we've already mentioned them if they trade down holland would be interesting bazellus would be interesting your guy topich would be interesting uh do you have like favorite 
it doesn't have to be a sleeper or even like who's like I guess your guy in the class is Topic, but do you have a you have a guy number two down the board somewhere that you love? Uh, you yeah, I mean, I really like Topic, Holland, and Callier. I think those three guys are all awesome. Of course, none of the you know those guys aren't doing much for the Hawks. They're not drafted. They're Cowher. they're not. But no, it's okay. That's okay. I mean, we, we're we're from in the last five minutes, we could do a little bit of non Hawks because I Collier's another one where I am Collier and Holland. I don't I don't understand how they're maybe gonna not go in the lottery. Like I don't get well, it. Well, you know the thing is like. You know, I like Callier because I feel like he has a chance to be an offensive engine. Agreed. But if he's not, yeah, does he pair well with another offensive engine? And the bar to be an engine in the NBA is so high. Yeah, so no, I, I, I do get the see, downside. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can see why, especially when, like, you know, like I said, I don't care about being wrong, which is maybe a totally ridiculous uh, well, it's take you're, you're, a draft you're, able to, you're, you're, able, you're able to do that when you're not running a team, and it's not like your job on the line if you miss the pick. Right. You know? Yeah, so. absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I could see upside in Collier as being a guy who can steer the ship for a good team. I think um, a couple other guys I like. I like Kilo Ware. I'm in. You know, this will be another one where I'm just going for the boomer bus guys. I feel like because no, uh, the Hawks fans like him too. Ware could be out of the league. <laughs> Like relatively quickly, I think. <laughs> but if he hits, you're going to be kicking yourself for not getting that guy. No, the talent's undeniable. Uh, back back when the Hawks were supposed to be picking number ten pre lottery, there were a lot of people who were like, "Hello, where at 10? I'm like, "Seems high to me," but sure. But to your point, if it works, he's he's one of those guys that this is going to sound crazy. You led this conversation talking about how that 2013 class, the two best players were not lottery picks, right? Giannis and Rudy. Yeah. He's not going to be those guys, but like, would it stun you if Kahlo Ware was like the third best player in this draft? No. Me either. No, he <laughs> could. Yeah. It's a lottery ticket chance for sure. I also really like Devin Carter. I think he would have been a good pick for the Hawks if they stayed at 10. Agreed. I, lo- um, I, lo- I love Devin Carter. He's just very good. In you know, I sent a tweet the other day where I was like, you know, because the Bulls had supposedly promised Carter, and I didn't like that. I'm like, well, you should just see who falls to you. Because, like, in some of these mock drafts, Holland's falling, and I'd take Holland over Carter. But yeah. I think that I, like, went too harsh on Carter. Carter's really good. If the Bulls draft Carter, I'm going to be like, well, he'll sure. be better than Dalen Terry and Julian Phillips and, you know, the rest of these. He'll probably be better than Patrick Williams and, like, the rest of these guys we've drafted. I like Patrick Williams, though. Uh, the Bulls' defense fell apart without Patrick Williams, so I want them to re-sign Patrick Williams. There's a quick Pat Will take, and, and they're and they're, go- and they're going to. By the way, I can't imagine they won't. You would think so. Restricted free agent, like clearly, the like the 2020 draft was not great to either of our franchises, and that's why we're playing the play-in game. Um, yeah, could have been, could have been Vassell, could have been Halliburton. Those are those are those are out there for sure. Yeah, but you know. Uh, so I like Carter and I think Devin Carter will be good. And I'm trying to think like, you know, I love Dillingham. <laughs> I'm in and I, I like Sharif too. So I'm always going for the small guard, I guess. But I think that Dillingham is such a good shooter off the ball that I don't, my, one of my big takes in this draft that I haven't really seen anyone else say is that I think the Pistons should take Dillingham at five. Because they have no shooting. They have no yeah. playmaking shot creation. Like, okay, so they need a power forward. They're going to take Bazellus, maybe. But, like, he's just another guy who can't do anything. <laughs> if he can't really shoot, good. no. I mean, I. it's not that dissimilar. I, I want Reed to go to Detroit. That's what I want. Yeah. Because I, I would want, take him from Houston. Same. I'm not, I'm not saying that he should fall that far. I'm just saying if, if Reed is there, that's the guy I want to see in Detroit because it gives you enough on ball – with yeah. Cade gives you a knockdown shooter. They just need everything, but they need shooting in particular, like the guys who right. can shoot the basketball and don't hit me shoot. So yeah, defensively, I, I don't know if he'll ever be, he might be Trey young rookie level bad. Like it's not, right. it's really not good, but I do, I do buy speaking of upside on offense, Rob Dillingham might be very, very good. Yeah. And like, you know, you drafted a SAR who just like can't, play any offense or you can't really like he's not going to shoot at all at least they need shooting so bad so like you draft him because he could cover up for someone who sucks on defense like yep. rob dilling so <laughs> that's one of my hot takes in this draft the pistons should take dilling and if they take bezelis i just feel like that's bad for everyone involved it's just like well this is you know like i like bezelis but he's got to go to 
a landing place that isn't the Pistons, which is what you could say for a lot of these guys who don't have don't go the, to Detroit, uh, please. The magic of Rob Dillingham. So yeah, uh, I think it's you know there's there's going to be some good players in this draft, and I've definitely hit the uh, the Stockholm you're, syndrome part where like you're talking yourself into it, like oh maybe this draft isn't that bad, and then like you think about it a little more, and you're like no nah, this draft sucks. No, nah, never totally. mind. Yeah, no, I, I I have done, and I, and I actually do mean this, and I promise I'll let you go. I do mean this that like I think it's a fairly normal draft after like five or six. I think it's yeah, fairly. The question normal. is. Where would Sar have gone in last year's draft? He probably would have gone six. Yeah, I've I've definitely I've asked people. Everyone's I feel like everyone's had this conversation on, on, yeah. online, offline with people, and yeah, it's somewhere in that no higher than four or five. Uh, I yeah, mean, I don't think he would have gone in the top five. No, I mean certainly not in the top three. The top three were going to that, that they were he wasn't in the top three. There's no as much as Scoot kind of struggled this year. He wasn't going in the top three of that draft. Um, so I think it starts with four and it could, could be as low as six or seven. Yeah. So that kind of tells you all you need to know. I mean, not to mention it again and kind of also plug it, but Vassini said on this show that he has no one in his top, his, his tier one or tier two of historical prospects, which is yeah, like, I don't do the historical prospect thing. I should, cause I've been doing it longer than Sam. Well, and, and he's um, pretty, and he's pretty like, and, and he, yeah. Me either, uh, and, he, and he's and he also said I'm not even stingy. Like he was, he was listening to some guys that like he had in tier two. That I'm like, all right, that was not stingy at all. And you still don't have anybody in the top two tiers. And he's like, yeah, that's where we are. 2024. Get yeah. your get your draft guides now. <laughs> so anyway, uh, well, Ricky, you gave me a lot of time. I appreciate it, man. Anything to plug? I know we talked about your mock draft. You have Ron Holland stuff coming. Where can people find everything that you are working on? Always sbnation.com. I'll be working all draft night. I think I'm grading every pick. Probably do some like roundup wrap ups after the draft. And yeah, I might try to write a Devin Carter thing too. I talked to him at the combine. I'm hopefully going to release the Holland piece this week. Maybe next week. We'll see. And yeah. Are, are you like the uh, emperor of Espionation at this point? Don't you have a fancy title now? What's, what's your title? Uh, I do manage the football writers and I manage the social team. There you go. You're I'm so out of destination. And I'm a working sports writer in the United States of America, which is that's yep. This sick. is the this is the first month, June, that I have not worked for SB Nation since I think 2011. Wow. In some fashion, obviously, I was not full time like you are. I was doing team site stuff, but I, yeah. I'm finally off the payroll after May. My Baseball podcast got shut down, and that was it for me. But I, I envy you. You've been. We've worked. Oh, not necessarily together, but we've worked at the same place, and I've we've interacted. Yeah. And I, I, de I deeply appreciate you coming on, especially this close to the draft, because this is my one week to go show. You're in a prime spot here, Ricky. This is a nice setup for everybody. Well, thanks for having me. If I'm the Hawks, I'm excited about this. I'm not dreading it. There's no point in dreading it. Like, <laughs> Lidger, yeah, it's Lidger. tougher when you got the future picks out the window. That's what makes it a little scary. But I mean, just last thing, and then I'll let no, you. No, you're fine. Like, you know, are you doing? Would you do like, uh, you know, four in your twenty-five pick back for one? I, I think I would. I would do that. I, I don't know if the Haw I don't know if the Hawks would. I would do that. If I, was I think I would too. Yeah. You know, the, the 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 very natural one everyone assumes is the four and eight for one, and I asked two people about that, and everyone's like. The Spurs aren't going to do that. The Spurs are not going to trade four and eight for one in this class, which is funny because last year would have been an obvious no for the number one pick. This year, it's kind of an obvious no for the Spurs. But yeah, if you get your own pick back, even twenty-seven pick, like totally. get one get one of your own picks back, I probably would do that personally. Totally. But yeah, if they are a Klingon or bust, which might be the case, I'm not saying it is, but if they are like we want Klingon, you can't be a hundred percent sure Klingon's getting to four. He's not getting someone, to four, probably. Someone like go ahead of you. So. There's there's some risk there if again if that's the guy they want you might have to just take him one or maybe you go down to two and get him but yeah it won't be uh, cut and dry for sure. All right, Ricky. Well, thanks for being here, my friend. Everybody should yep, follow Ricky's me. work across the board. Please subscribe to this show. We have a lot more coming between now and the draft. So stay tuned for that. We'll see you all next time.